Morning all, I have a very interesting game to show you this morning. It's against the Plowed Out. I've actually played it on the ICC, a very strong Grandmaster. Suet's Italic was playing white, and I've played him four times at least. Um, and his opponent, Gila Sachs, another strong Grandmaster. The tournament was the Maroxi Memorial in a place called Sejard in 1997. I'll put the PGN in the description of the video. Um, so. Ata Suat Atalik is, is one of the leading um, Turkish uh, grandmasters and Gila Sachs is Hungarian. Uh, so in this game Suat kicked off with d4 and we saw knight f6 and after c4 the game headed into the Nimzo engine defence. Now after bishop b4 queen c2 is one of Kasparov's favourite moves. It's one of the most popular moves in the position. Um, now it avoids the structural damage of bishop takes c3, but there is there is a but to it. That black can sometimes gain tempo on, on the queen. Uh, and in this game, after d5, a3, bishop takes c3. The intention is clear to take with the queen. But we get the first tempo gainer with knight e4. Now after queen c2, the most usual move is c5. Black in this game played knight c6 immediately threatening the pawn and also about to liberate the position with e5 and maybe for further tempo gains. So against this white calmly played e3 and now we see e5 which you might think is a little bit controversial because hold on a sec, hold on, isn't this knight loose here, can't white just play ta taking and threaten the knight? Well actually this is this was a, a theoretical position uh, in 1997, quite a lot of games playing this d5 because black has a particular idea in mind. After c takes d5 he's not losing a piece, both knights are attacked but black is playing queen takes d5 here. You might think okay although uh, the queen is protecting the knight on e4 isn't this subject to attack? So bishop c4 is played and the point is revealed now that after queen a5 check this knight's immune for a moment still because okay if bishop d2 the knight can be used it can take there but if b4 and this is the point now that although the queen and knight is attacked here there's a pin to exploit so knight takes b4 exploiting this pin Again, quite a few games from this position. It'll be interesting to, to see that in second pass. White now plays queen takes e4, allowing this seemingly dangerous discovered and double check. And black is opting now after king e2. Black first plays a check and then takes this rook. So, a bit of a strange starting position. <laughs> This position here. What what has actually happened? Well, actually, we have a loose bishop which is threatened. We have a pinned knight over here. On the other hand, white does have the bishop pair. Uh, black's knight might take some time to come back in the game. Uh, black has no defence around this king if he castles. No kind of defenders there. So can white do something with the two bishops and the queen? So let's see, bishop b2. For the moment, uh, because of this queen e1 check, the knight's not actually attacked, it's protected okay by the queen. Um, so black in this position castles. Now hold on a sec, you might uh, wonder, well hold on, did, did white have in this position, for example, queen takes e5 check. That's something to really uh, check in the second pass. Uh, possibly bishop e6 taking uh, and then castling but we'll check that in the second pass. So in the, in the game continuation black castled here. Now a slightly strange uh, move you might think was played in this position White plays king 
G3, actually. King G3. Okay, what is white actually threatening with King G3? Or is white just trying to avoid any checks, say on D1? In the game, we see now black now playing King H8. And that center pawn seems up for grabs here. So clearly there's a question, couldn't black have taken perhaps on D4? Well, actually, it's even without a second pass check. This, this is really uh, a very, very dangerous position with these two bishops pointing at the black king here. After king g3, if e takes d4, in fact, queen takes d4, it looks as though this is end of game, actually, because this pawn can't help defend g7. The threat of mate seems impossible to parry. Okay, so at least with King H8, well, for the moment, uh, there's no battery with Queen and Bishop. And Queen takes E5, okay, you might think that's possible, with D5 to follow. Uh, maybe Bishop E6 is possible there, something to check again. In the game, D takes E5, so an exchange stack for a pawn, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Three, four, five, six. Nope, not even for a pawn, just the exchange down here. Okay, is it enough to be the exchange down for a pawn in this position? Bishop e6 is played. And now, very interestingly, uh, can you guess <laughs> what white plays in this position? If I give you 10 seconds starting from now, or well, you might want to pause the video. Okay. White plays Knight F3. And <laughs> how many options are there? The, the Queen is double attacked from Rook and Knight. If the Queen wants to go over here, it's just losing this knight. And this was meant to be pinned against the rook, so the rook is taken. Now we see a forcing move, knight g5, threatening mate on the spot on h7. Rather crude, but creates critical weaknesses. How does black actually parry this? He plays g6, and he's weak in this diagonal. And we've seen some brilliancy games before where this diagonal being weakened with g6 uh, is not very good often. Now, how to exploit this diagonal efficiently? How would you exploit this diagonal? If I gave you 10 seconds starting from now, what would you play in this position? Okay. White plays knight takes f7. Check. Now, if bishop takes f7, then e6 does seem absolutely all over, because queen e5 to follow. Very quick battery. So rook takes f7, trying to keep a blockade now after bishop takes e6. White's bishop is in front of the pawn that needs to be moved first. But white really wants to get this bishop in action. The queen is a bit helpless at the moment. It can't use the b1 square. Uh, so the rook moves at the moment. And now a very interesting move again. Is played here. Bishop f7, stopping, for example, rook e8. e6 is, is going to happen here. And if the bishop's here rather than, say, back here on a2, that means it's controlling g8, which makes this whole diagonal even more dangerous. Controlling g8. So these two bishops are working very well with the queen here in this particular position. Black takes on f7, and now we see just queen and bishop having to carry on here, the attack. Is it strong enough? King g8, virtually forced. If rook g7, queen e5, end of game. Black's pieces are just nowhere near the king. If we look at this, it's just a totally helpless position. <laughs> or is it? 
well actually second pass because rook g8 seems apparent there but then maybe e7 carries the threat of queen g7 rook takes an e8 so e7 could finish the job here but that's something to check out as well uh, so king g8 is played queen d4 threatening mate on the spot again the king tries to run but uh, to no avail white just takes on f7 threatening queen g7 and f8 black takes and now queen d7 check and the king is left to these two very dangerous attacking pieces bishop f6 no defense end of game black had to resign now in this game informator awarded this not only a best game prize but a best novelty there's a novelty in this game somewhere let's check it again in the second pass and without turning on an engine for a moment, let's do a reference check on this position after bishop c4. Just to show how many games have been from this position. Okay, 36. We follow with queen a5, it's the only move really. b4 is the only move really played here. 36, all 36 games, b4. Knight takes b4, yes, this is the idea. Now, a takes b4 has only been played once before. That's not a good move. Uh, or is it? There was actually a draw. Khan versus Horvath was a draw, believe it or not. Let's have a quick look at the initial game continuation. Knight e2 here. And eventually, um, it was actually a draw at move 50. Okay, but most games follow this path. If we go back, of in this position, queen takes e4, 35 games. So we see the knight c2 check, only move ready, for black to continue. Now king e2, all 35 games, king e2. And these games range from 1936, 1947, you know, earlier than this game, basically. So King E2 has been played before. Now 30 games are with Queen E1 check. Five games are with Knight takes the Rook. Let's follow a bit on the check. So King F3 is, is really the only decent place for the King. Black takes. It's a long forcing line, this, this opening, for sure. White plays bishop b2 now in 29 games. So where is the novelty? Black castles. King g3, 21 games. Even in 1948, king g3 was played. There's a game Bay against Stumpers. In 1967, king g3 played. And in, actually, in all these king g3 games, 1969, h6 was the move after. So king g3, um, black had been playing the move h6 in three games in 1948, 67 and 69. King h8 started to appear after 1994, 1905, king h8. So what does h6 do uh, for black? Well, that's, that's interesting here. 11 games are actually with h6. The best players playing that Adam Mekin Gasanov. Uh, so Adams has actually played. Believe it or not, there's a Kasparov Adams game in this position where h6 was played here. EU Cup in Paris in 2004. And the game continued like this. So Kasparov putting his king on h2. So bishop f5, very sharp game, Adams, is he nabbing in perpetual or something? He's getting quite a bit of material here, well it's Kasparov that might be nabbing the perpetual. Exciting game there, Kasparov Adams 19, in 2004, that's one of the most high profile games in this variation. 
Okay, uh, so Timon and Sax had played King H8. Obviously, Sax in this game. Timon's also played King H8. Let's see what happened in the Timon game. That was against Lautier in 1994. We did actually see Knight F3 in this repeat of the Rook sack. Now, in this position, Black played F5. After Queen takes E5. Still seems quite dangerous. Check. And now Black plays the very resourceful Bishop H3. <laughs> okay, so White took here. Queen B1. But eventually, okay, White actually won this game anyway. So in this position, although two exchanges down, Lautier, who was 2645, beat Timon in this line. It seems very dangerous. He's winning one exchange back here. He's getting a lot of pawns. Uh, the bishops seem to be working very well. And there's four connected past pawns here on the king side. Black resigned in this position. So it seems a very promising line overall. And that was in 1994. This game was in 1997. Okay, so this line pursues, this game rather, pursues king h8. Um, if well, e, e takes d4. There were, there were not really too many options apart from king h8 and h6. So we see d takes e5, and black playing bishop e6. Uh, so d takes e5 here. Now all the games, actually, in Chess Base Magazine 62. D takes e5, this position, believe it or not, is given a double exclamation mark. So it was featured in Chess Base Magazine 62. Very serious players often um, are subscribers of Chess Base. They have the database and sometimes they even follow the magazine. And apparently on move 17, I think this is the novelty, which also got the game awarded in Informata. So D takes e5. Before this game, here, if we did a reference check, the move knight f3, uh, knight f3, and there's some, a mixed bag of results with knight f3. And it'll be interesting to know why. Uh, so, if knight f3, for example, uh, Timen had beat a Grandmaster Hillop um, person in. Uh, in 1997. Let's see how. So why was D takes E5 an important innovation? Black took on G5, knight G5, F5. Okay, where are Black's resources, you might ask? Queen takes E5. White is nearly delivering a knockout blow on the diagonal, you think. Bishop D7. White played check. Off the takes takes. Now black plays a check here. E takes f4, queen d1. Threatening to exterminate white with queen g4. Check. F3, knight c2, the knight's coming out. And white seems a long way off in using that long diagonal in this in this particular case. Or is he? Now he's threatening mate. Black defends g7. So why can't this just be taken? Let's let's do an engine check on this position. Tim played rook g8 here and the engine is indicating what white played, king f2. So if white takes our weakness of the last move, look at this, the weakness of the last move, the bishop's not covering g6 here which gives black the resource g6 defending g7 and now is apparently just better so there's a novelty here um, in this move 17 if we go back to move 17 um, this d takes e5 move might require quite a lot of 
depth uh, for an engine to uh, check out. Uh, so in in the in the Timon game, not just to review that, just just quickly again, Black had amazingly. which means now rook g8 is possible for queen g6 as a resource there. So we see king f2, queen a6. So what's happening here? Check queen g6 here. Now taking on g8, if, if the king didn't move, well queen takes g2 is threatened. And uh, Black was better here. Black now uh, won here. I think White resigned in this position. So that shows Black can be really uh, resourceful. So how did actually uh, how were the resources uh, squashed by D takes E five? Okay, so D takes E five, pardon me, in our in our main game. What does the engine actually think is going on here? It it does kind of rule out um F fives, I guess. Uh sorry, a bit of a problem with the uh board. Okay, uh, got a, got a bit of a problem with the board view actually. Pardon me. Let's get the board large anyway, and I'll sh I'll show you just the engine. I'll I'll t tell you the relevant engine analysis here. The engine thinks Black's doing fine plus one point four three. What it did do with Bishop e six, and now he's not so sure because of Knight h three. Believe it or not. So let's follow the Bishop e six. What is White actually uh, threatening here? Bishop d3 is now the threat. A menacing threat of plus 18 with bishop d3. Okay, so bishop e6 was perhaps assumed to be a safe defense for black up until this game. So we see knight f3, the queen takes, and we see knight g5, and black's forced to play g6. And now we see the move. Not queen f4, but knight takes f7. And the engine at the initially just thinks this is zero. So maybe a lot of people, human beings, just thought, what, what is going on here? Is this just a draw line or something? The rook takes, bishop takes. And here, okay, this, this is where it gets interesting because the engine is reckoning rook takes f2 was a viable. A resource here for equality. Rook g7 it doesn't like at all. So on rook takes f2, was there, is there anything brilliant in this line? So if we take, check, king g3, check, king h3, king g7, if there's something here, just seems equal at the moment zero, but this is only a certain depth. King g7. Is this this is like an amazing computer defense? King g7. Maybe the king's coming to h6 or something here. But why even in this position has bishop d7? There was a, f a flicker of king h6 mentioned. Now Black's in serious trouble. What what is the problem with King H six here? You might ask. E six. This pawn looks dangerous. Say Rook F five. Bishop F six. And this is getting very very uh, complex. For example, uh, check. Really, King G four is is much better for White. Because of e7 coming, believe it or not, this looks really scary. Bishop's covering that h4 square. If rook takes f6, 
e7 again and I guess this is too slow we just take care and we're queening the pawn uh, soon after a check so this this is all very good as well uh, this position here e6 there's no realistic defense so we're starting to see the power of this novelty um, that in this position even here with black counter sacrificing a rook black seems to be um, technically lost bishop d7 is the, move, the killer move here uh, so if queen e2 what does that do exactly it just loses the knight for a moment check we have queen h4 and white's better here so the whole thing the whole novelty d takes e5 is the important thing about this brilliancy uh, novelty so in the game we just saw this stunning continuation where uh, black well he didn't play the engine move he played rook g7 and this just fells I think most clinically to bishop f7 if the bishop would just casually move back on the diagonal I'm not entirely sure it's a big deal in fact it could be completely lost for white Uh, so queen queen d1 for example black's got the d6 check now it's not entirely uh, so clear in this position and um, this this position here is nowhere uh, as good as this move bishop f7 so it's an amazing follow up bishop f7 so if if taking here check um well this was the game continuation pardon me queen uh d4 is is crushing also e takes is crushing as well e takes could have been played for queen c4 check And um, I think the Black Kings had it in this position as well. Eventually, or we'll just Queen takes a8 here is sufficient with a raging attack carrying on. But uh, in the game, it was much more, much sweeter continuation. So here is absolutely slaughter time. It's mating four now. So there's there's something uh, there's a very it's a theoretically important game, and the innovation is actually um, D takes E5 uh, in this game. So at move 17, D takes E5. Okay, uh, just 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 to recap on something though, on on the reference check for the. Um, Kasparov, the Adams Kasparov, did Adams miss an opportunity here for this brilliant, uh, brilliancy? Could he have used it? And when, when was exactly that game? Uh, the Adams game is not uh, Kasparov against Adams. Pardon me, King G3 uh, in 2007. In this game, okay, so King G3. In the Kasparov Adams game, just to recap on that, Adams played H6. Uh, so in this H6 line, as opposed to King H8, uh, well, it's ruling out Knight F3 to G5. The G5 square is, is secure against Knight F3 to G5. And given that's the case, the, the Rook sack is, is probably not as a factual Kasparov played h4 here if we if we try the rook sack I think it doesn't do anything black just takes the rook there's nothing thanks very much okay so it's it's to do with the king h8 line in particular here in our main game that uh, this d takes e5 uh, was an important novelty in this position okay comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much